Hello and welcome to the Ask Assad Show. I'm Michael Gaines, host of the podcast NOV Today, and glad you're joining us for our conversation today as we look to bring insight out and share some of the uh, not only insights, but also observations and analysis from our team here at NOV. So glad that you are joining us today. And uh, with me, I have, uh, our, as always, Shelby Dumaine, who is with us to uh, just give us a, a quick reminder on how you can uh, submit your questions for uh, the show. Hey, Shelby. Hey, Michael. Uh, so for today's show, we have, um, uh, we're have we actually going to be doing a live Q&A. So typically with the Ask Assad show, we have our, our mailbag where we go through questions. But today we have a uh, extra special guest. So we wanted to do a little bit of live Q&A. So if you're watching the show and you have questions for um, Assad, you'd like to ask Assad something or our, our special guest, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, you can comment those questions at any point throughout the show. Uh, and as I spoke about before, we have that mailbag. And that's an option if you want to have a question, maybe for another episode, if you want to suggest a topic that we should cover. I mean, if you have any ideas, we have two ways that you can let us know. The first way is with an email. So you can email us at askassad at nov.com. So it's on the screen there, askassad, A-S-S-A-A-D at nov.com. Um, and then the next way, it's something I'm really excited and, and I'm really excited today to, to show you an example of this, but we have a comment, a phone line where you can actually leave us a voicemail and ask your question. Uh, you can stay anonymous or you can let us know your name. So here we have the number, it's country code plus one, three, four, six, two, two, three, four, seven, nine, nine. So you can call and leave us a voicemail. And uh, like I said, today we're actually going to use um, one of the callers that called into our voicemail, and um, that's what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to play that voicemail for you. This is someone who called in and asked a question. So here we go. I think if sound's not working, it's uh, so we have the subtitles up there. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, yeah, no, that's that's good. I'm glad we did have the subtitles in that one. So <laughs> we'll try to pr play that again uh, in a little bit later in the program. Yeah. But uh, glad that we uh, have folks continue to call in and look forward to additional uh, additional comments or, or questions. So that's mm -hmm. good. Thanks. Thanks, Shelby. Appreciate the, uh, the update on that. All right. So uh, as always, and, and uh, certainly uh, wouldn't be the show without them, we have Asad Mahana, who is the Director of Business Strategy here at NOV. Hey, Asad, good to see you this week. Hello, Michael, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. All right, so, well, thank you for being, thank you for having the show. So <laughs> I, I thank you, you don't need to be thanking me. Uh, well, good, well, good to see you. So uh, as always, uh, week in review. So, uh, you know, kind of looking back uh, over the last uh, week or so, I know there are a couple Couple items that uh, that kind of piqued our, our interest, and, and probably starting out with uh, with OPEC Plus. That's right. Yeah, they they announced uh, today. Actually, they had their uh, their meeting uh, planned. I think they finished about an hour ago, um, and the decision was to ease a little bit on the record production cuts that they've announced uh, a few months. And that's gonna uh, the plan is for the production cuts to ease. Uh, starting August uh, and carry on until uh, December. Um, Brent uh, crude has uh, uh, hovered around 40 to 45 dollars per barrel in the last few weeks, which is kind of what drove OPEC Plus to that decision, so it's signaling some sort of stability or recovery uh, from from the the multi-decade low of 90 dollars we saw in in March. Um, We've also seen a significant drop in, uh, in U.S. crude stockpiles, uh, which which was which was also a relief to uh, uh, storage tanks and capacity. Uh, so, uh, if I get it right, and I'm, it's you know the messages are still uh, un unclear or final from the OPEC meeting, but from what we're, from what we're hearing is that um, it's going to be a 1.6 or 1.7 million 
barrels per day uh, that's going to be eased away from the 9.7 million so they're going to reach 8.1 by december um and and that's a that's a that's a significant change uh, now some of it is uh, uh premature in, in some places around the world, but uh, in others where uh, the light crude oil uh, is uh, is in high demand as opposed to the less restricted medium crude oil, uh, especially in China, I think uh, that that easing from the Middle East and Russia is somewhat, somewhat timely. Uh, in parallel to OPEC plus, Michael, um, rate count uh, in the US keeps uh, dropping. We saw the latest mm -hmm. uh, drop of five rigs last week down to 258, the lowest we've seen since uh, count has uh, began. Uh, but we've seen uh, eight rigs uh, come up online in Canada, up to 26 rigs, which is a pretty low number. But uh, you know what? It's a it's a positive, uh, positive number. So uh, we'll take it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're, you're, you talked about rig count, um, and of course, uh, with that, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about the, the different types of uh, uh, rigs and, and really operations that go on. And uh, of course, one of them uh, being directional drilling, but, but what's really coming to the, the forefront has been remote directional drilling. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's been a, that's been a very, uh, 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 trendy topic, <laughs> uh, and from the uh, the silent question that we we had played earlier, that I hope we can play again. Sure. Uh, remote remote directional drilling is something that's uh, that's uh, uh, that's become uh, a lot more uh, important to operators and service companies. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know. Do do we have that question ready, Michael, uh, to to play? I, I think we're getting getting that one set up. I'm actually looking to see if I can't uh, pull it up myself. So, so, so let me let me maybe give a little bit of uh, background on what is directional yeah. drilling uh, in, in this case. It's uh, it's really typically on a on any horizontal drilling job. You're going to have two directional drillers, two MWD engineers that are on site, uh, and they usually are alternating between shifts. Uh, when we talk about remote directional drilling, it's mainly the directional driller's tasks and sometimes the MWD tasks, uh, some other times the geosteering and LWD tasks, they're all taken uh, to a dedicated facility offsite. Um, and really the aim there is to gain efficiencies by uh, leveraging that small group that's sitting in an operating center uh, with drilling experts sitting in town over the large number of personnel to be distributed on a per rig basis. So all of that really gets you better uh, quality uh, uh, of the well, uh, better performance, better efficiency, and, and importantly, the, the safety of the crew. Um, it, it's nothing new. I, would, I wouldn't say remote directional drilling is a new topic or uh, it's been talked about for years, um, but it's, it's certainly become more possible today. Uh, digitalization of the oil field, uh, the the need to reduce costs and and certainly COVID nineteen all all contributed to that and and uh, we brought the, the the heavy gun the expert to talk to us a little bit about that sure today. all right well we're gonna try to play that uh, the question that we we got on our comment line so let's see if we can't uh, give us another go hi I'm a direction of drilling product land employee based out of West Texas. And I was wondering if you could tackle the topic of uh, remote drilling or remote directional drilling, which has been uh, prevailing here lately due to the COVID-19 restrictions. Thank you. All right. So uh, remote directional drilling and specifically talking about uh, uh, its impact uh, or prevalence uh, during the, the COVID-19 uh, period in time. So yeah, definitely want to, to talk talk through that. And as you said, uh, we do have uh, a guest with us. So uh, Tony Pink is actually joining us. He's the VP of technology within uh, NOV's Wellbore technology segment. So hey, Tony, good to see you. Hi, guys. And hi, audience. So uh, for those that haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, could you give us a quick, uh, quick background who you are and, uh, and what you do? So I'll give you the background, I, and I guess relative to relevant to today is uh, I, I started my career uh, offshore 
uh, with uh, Slumberger. Um, five years of uh, MWD and LWD, and then five years of uh, directional drilling in uh, uh, the U.S., uh, Venezuela, and Nigeria, uh, and and the and the North Sea. And uh, actually, when I came over to the U.S. in 2006, uh, I uh, actually set up, I think, what was at the time the first remote directional drilling uh, facility. It was uh, uh, set up in Weatherford, Texas, uh, for EOG, who were drilling an enormous amount of wells at that time in the Barnett. And uh, they, they just couldn't get hold of directional drillers at that time. You know, that was when the Barnett was at its full boom. And so we, uh, we, we trained up a, a group of drillers and uh, we were doing it much, much more low tech than today. We were doing it with uh, uh, two way walkie talkies and uh, we did remote uh, directional drilling out on the, the site. And uh, some of you may ask, why, why, is, why didn't that just uh, continue? And uh, I think a couple of uh, sort of things happened. I, I think um, a lot more directional drillers came into the, the marketplace and got trained up so that the operators could have individuals out on the rig site. And then uh, also, um, you know, th there, there were some cultural challenges, you know, uh, uh, the company man really wanted uh, the directional driller to be out there to be his nighttime eyes and ears. Yeah. So uh, we, we, we did it uh, for, uh, I think it was about a year um, and then it uh, folded up. So my role since then, uh, I uh, um, did a lot of uh, automation for NOV and I'm uh, currently uh, doing a big project on uh, digitalization. So all these sort of things are, uh, are linked, uh, linked together. So uh, that's good. Thanks. So I appreciate the, the follow up. So I, th I think uh, between Assad and I probably have, have a couple couple of questions for you. Maybe I'll, I'll lead off. And, and I know Assad, uh, as always, with his silver lining and list of questions is, is probably going to beat me to the punch. But but maybe I'll, I'll lead off here. So, Tony, you know, when we talk about remote directional drilling. Uh, maybe just just kind of setting the table. I mean, what's what's in it? from uh, you know an, an operator standpoint and you know what are they what are they doing you know when we're looking at kind of at this space again remote directional drilling when we talk about again that. yeah thanks Mike I mean tied back to some of what I said you know previously you know what what's happened in, in our industry is you know we've really um, lost a lot of talent over the last decade uh, out of directional drilling um you know it, it really was uh probably in in the 90s and and early 2000s a, a very high skilled job yeah. so a lot of we lost a lot of those people yeah um and then there was always competition for the best directional driller to be on a particular operator's uh, rig so as that competition occurred you know, really drove up day rates of directional drillers to you know uh, at one point i think it was pretty well uh, two thousand dollars a day per directional drill. Yeah, so you'd probably be four thousand dollars a day in man cost. Yeah, and as we've got to today, um, what we're finding is we don't have those directional drillers, um, and in the cost prohibitive environment we're in, and the impact of COVID, where we really, you know, we want to minimize the number of people on the rig site. There's a real drive to doing uh, directional drilling. But there's also, you know, a fundamental question is, you know, you, if you look, if you think today, okay, when was the last time I was on an airplane with a navigator? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, navigation is done by the pilot or it's done by the uh, air traffic control. So if you take that analogy to directional drilling, you know, why do you need the navigator standing up there on the rig floor? Yeah. Uh, take the, uh, the, the, the pilot who's the driller. He, he flies the rig. And let's uh, let's equip him with the automation to be able to do this, or the algorithms, or things. So I think what's in it for the operators is a improvement in performance. So they have maybe now cherry picked the best directional drillers, and they've got them in their remote operation center. So those those best guys, the best navigators, or the best steerers are are sitting there in the in the remote operation center. And then they're spreading that talent over a large number of rigs. I, I believe uh, uh, um, Hess's uh, operation center was perf certainly perfectly capable of handling one DD handling five uh, projects at one time. 
And if that's a really, really good DD, that that uh, directional performance you, you, you see as being uh, duplicated, yeah? Yeah. And then the other one is that the helmsman or the pilot is now the the drillers have so many more tools at their fingertips uh, to to help them deliver that uh, that job on location. And then the third bit is if you're going to have a remote directional driller and a, 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 you need to have decent communications. And I think that's actually still the weak link. You know, we yeah. do we don't have fantastic bandwidth still out to a, a lot of rigs, but. You know, a lot of rigs now are on LTE, uh, have decent connectivity. So something can be sent from uh, the remote operation center to the to the rig uh, and uh, and back and forth when surveys come in. So I think we uh, technology is, is rapidly enabling this to happen. Yeah. So so Tony, with uh, if if I hear you right, you you're saying there's performance improvement because we're 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 getting the experienced staff. To, uh, to, to spread their skills on multiple wells. Uh, it's a safer operation and you get better communication, although there are challenges there. Th th all of this must must lead to a better uh, well bore quality. Uh, is that right? You would, you would hope so, yeah. And, and, you know, and obviously the other beneficial technologies out there is, you know, we're starting to see uh, more and more curves, which is the most challenging part of a well being done with, um, rotary steerable tools yeah? yeah so the simplification that comes with rotary steerable tools means that that remote directional drilling again becomes easier you know the uh, the the ability to downlink to tools can be fully automated either by controlling the valve or controlling the mud pumps so that downlink can be sent to a rotary steerable tool no matter what the vendor is and and, and automatically uh, controlled so yeah, I think uh, I think we're getting there. Um, and from what I'm hearing is some of the operators are definitely seeing an improvement in uh, borehole quality and, uh, and, and, and directional performance. Yeah. So what is what is the distinction between remote and automated? Ah, good, very, you know, very good question. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I, I've been part of this. So I actually wrote a patent for automated directional drilling uh, about six years ago. Um, and when we look, when we looked at it, um, there, there really are some, some cha big challenges in there, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to that. So remote directional drilling is really uh, taking the uh, navigation component off the rig site, uh, consuming the data in a remote operations center, predicting where, uh, understanding where you are to, from the survey and where you need to be and then sending back a uh, command to the to the rig floor saying that you need to slide 65 feet, 23 degrees to the left. And that command then being instigated by the uh, driller on location. So he does that. He becomes the helmsman or pilot and he just uh, he manually uh, steers the turns the motor controls the differential pressure and, and, and steers the bit in the direction that he uh, he wants to go. Um, automated directional drilling is uh, now that navigation component come in. The position, current bit position is, uh, uh, is uh, projected and the desired position over the next 90 feet is uh, uh, um, uh, calculated by the, the software. The software then sends a command to the uh, top drive and the draw works. So the top drive then orients the uh, tool face automatically and the draw works lowers the bit on bottom. And then as the bit goes on bottom, the uh, uh, software compensates for the uh, uh, differential pressure and the reactive torque and orients the bit in the direction that you want to go. Those automated functions, there, there, are, there are about three or four applications out in the in the world and uh, uh, they have degrees of uh, effectiveness yeah mm -hmm. um, some of them work from from what I understand about 60 percent of the time so 60 uh, percent of the time uh, the the process is fully automated the remaining 40 percent the driller has to take over and do it himself yeah uh, and then in extreme cases, when you're drilling through very challenging rock with varying uh, uh, formation hardnesses, then the app fails and the driller fails. And now you have this floating directional driller that happens to be out nearby who gets in his truck and turns up on the rig site. Yeah. 
so I, I think the failing of automated directional drilling will occur until completely uh, will not be completely satisfying until we have that 99% solution, yeah, where the uh, orientation of the top drive, orientation of the uh, and acceleration and deceleration of the uh, draw works keeps the bit on target better than a human being. And uh, that really, really uh, needs to have uh, an artificial intelligence machine learning component that thinks a bit like a human because the unfortunately you know the material that we drill through changes every foot in its hardness and consistency and whatever and, and that and that's a very complex um, interaction for a control system and if you have very slow uh, um, mud pulse data it's really difficult to to do right so we kind of in NOV we, we, we had a go and we, we and we utilize the fact that NOV have wired drill pipe and we did it with high speed data and steered very, very accurately using uh, an application with a uh, wired drill pipe. What we want though is to be able to do that so that we can do it with ev for everybody on every rig and every rock. Yeah. And, and I think us and Slumberger and uh, Motive and uh, uh, the other vendors, you know, all of us have struggled with that artificial intelligent component. Yeah. Um, because it, it's a complex problem. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, I, I'd like to ask to kind of put our directional drilling uh, uh, hat on. And, and, and when we see Schlumberger announcing um, uh, Olivier Lepeche in a JP Morgan event not too long ago, saying that over 60% of their operation was conducted remotely in Q1. Uh, same thing with Baker Hughes went out and said that uh, they delivered 60% of global drilling services remotely. Um, uh, that, that there seems to be a drive uh, from the big directional drillers out there. Mm -hmm. Yet we know that, uh, especially uh, true in the U.S. market, uh, the dominant force is for the smaller directional players. Um, wh why why is it more important than ever today for for these guys to to get on board and adopt some sort of some sort of technology that gets the directional driller in that space. Yeah, and I, I, I think you know it, it's it's you know good question. It's so, you know the and I, and I think it, I don't think the blame uh, necessarily lies with the uh, the small directional drillers. You know maybe the blame lies with the business model of, of the application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so currently, how I see the applications uh, being uh, managed is the application is provided by a service company as part of a package with tools and equipment and everything. So it's a, it's a part of a directional drilling package. So they have a directional drilling package and they have an automated or a remote directional drilling package and they have automated directional drilling package, which kind of locks out, which is I'm sure, you know, some, some of their objective is locking out uh, the smaller, smaller players and capturing the market for the big guys. Because of their investment in software, so what I think uh, for maybe NOV or a startup is, um, you know, build an application that is license can be licensed by anyone, and then we, uh, you know, us or them level the playing field uh, very very quickly because then it doesn't become rig dependent, it doesn't become tool dependent. It means that um, you know, I could quit NOV next week, set myself up as a little independent directional driller and do it from the house. Yeah. Um, actually, that's maybe a good idea. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I, I, I think uh, I think someone out there uh, needs to uh, really open it up for the, those guys to play in it. But the, the, there is a challenge. You know, U.S. land has um, lived on mud pulse telemetry in particular. Yeah. And slow mud pulse telemetry. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, at one time in uh, West Africa, uh, when I was drilling for Slumberjay, we we did tune up a uh, power pulse tool to only send up tool faces drilling this critical section in uh, in in Nigeria, and uh, we had one second update on the tool face. Yeah, and I remember the driller. Uh, us changing the tools out and the slow tools coming back out and then the driller going, uh, oh, I can't live with this stuff. This, this once every three seconds is, this is antiquated. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they got completely used to the one second data. Yeah. 
Um, and then you see, obviously, the opportunity with the uh, wired drill pipe. Um, it, you know, you could send those tool faces up every half a second directly into a controller, uh, and then the controller doesn't have to guess. You know, but again, you know, we in NOV have probably got to get the economics of wired pipe down to the point where it, it, it becomes commercially viable in even in our uh, very very competitive u.s land market yeah 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 you've you've touched a little bit tony on um, uh, data and, and and high integrity data uh being a an important pillar for for anything like that to happen i mean for you to be sitting in a remote location uh operating a directional job uh hundreds or thousands of miles away uh there there has to be some sort of infrastructure as somebody who's uh who's uh who sleeps and eats technology i'm i'm pretty sure you got some good exposure on what's going on out there and maybe have something up your sleeve that's uh coming online yeah yeah where's uh where's that heading so you know um you know really where where we have to go you know um in our industry is we, we have to move this capability to to the edge. You know, I, I don't want to use that as a buzzword, but it, it, it sort of is. And it's really applicable to to the oil industry or mining or, you know, people who do their business in remote and tough places. Yeah. So, so if, if, what does that what does that mean to the audience? Edge means that really you can put uh, large scale analytics uh, with a, a, you know, large computing capability on a very small device uh, on a rig floor. Uh, you know, an edge box is, you know, this size, yeah. And so you can put all the uh, application and the data acquisition and everything you need into a very uh, small uh, box that can do that at high speed talking to the rig's control system uh, and uh, and close that really tight loop that is needed um, you know, directional drilling doesn't, it doesn't need a, a tighter loop than about one second, but one second with no latency is still pretty, uh, pretty quick. Yeah. And I hear that sometimes the data movement from, uh, rig to, um, service providers, cloud to customers, cloud to remote operation center and back again, that, that, that loop is four seconds. Yeah. And, and a four second latency in automated directional drilling means that you're working on the previous tool face that you, that you were. Mm -hmm. So you're making poor decisions and that pushes people back to doing things on the uh, on, on site again. So, um, you know, we in NOV, you know, we're, we're working on a new platform called Max Platform that will be uh, uh, coming out uh, later this year. Uh, and, and a lot of those latencies and a lot of the ability to take a data point and give it to the right person um, and that right person to consume it and then feed it back to the machines. You know, we're trying to take a neutral uh, uh, standpoint in the in the middle, uh, you know, take a Switzerland strategy of the, you know, we let every little directional drilling company plug in and we'll you know, share that data with any drilling contractor and uh, provide it to any operator so that everyone can play in, play in that space. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for asking the question. That's a, that sounds like a pretty, pretty neat uh, solution uh, with, uh, with edge capabilities. I'm assuming you don't mind Tony uh, sharing your information or would you be the right person for people to. Yeah. People can. Yeah. They can reach out to me. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, and we'll, we'll, we'll feed that out um you know we, we're actually you know you can you, the, you you have the slightest conversation and people uh you know reach out very very quickly uh i think it's resonating uh with uh, a lot of people and you know it, it's it's that interoperability that, right. that will open this up yeah it's uh, you know some things that are being driven by uh, some some of the industry bodies like um dwis and uh, uh, SPE DSATs and uh, OSDU, um, you know, making it, you know, if we NAV do the universal translation, you know, we become the Rosetta Stone of of rig site data. Yeah. Um, then what? others can play. Yeah? yeah. You know, if 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 the poor guy who made his Java app to do remote directional drilling then goes out to the rig and can't handle that Modbus feed coming off the control system, 
then they have to spend hundreds of thousands in doing the connectivity to all the different rig, uh, rigs here. So if we play the middle player and do the Rosetta Stone for data uh, for them, then then the the little guys can play in play in that space. Um, you know, yeah, we our business model will share in that bit of that revenue, uh, but we, we, we won't uh, alienate the the small uh, uh, small guys uh, playing in the space. Yeah. Excellent. It's really good. Yeah, no, this has been uh, been really insightful, Tony. I know uh, yeah, there there are folks that haven't had the opportunity to to hear you. I know that you've you've talked on this for for many years. I, I think I even had the opportunity to sit in your uh, kind of directional drilling one hundred and one class uh, many many years ago. Uh, but but certainly really really insightful. So appreciate you you sharing. Um, before we get to some of the questions that uh, we've had uh, people putting in the comment section, and, and just as a quick reminder, if you do have some questions that uh, you'd like to, to ask Tony or Assad uh, on remote directional drilling or directional drilling uh, in general, feel free to put that in the comment section, uh, whether you're watching us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. Uh, but for you, Tony, um, kind of wanted to talk as you look ahead and you know we we talk about maybe moving into the the area of uh, of remote directional drilling. Um, you know, it's it's I, I guess you could make the argument it isn't necessarily the the de facto standard today. And I know we talked about you know some of those those ideas, but just if you could kind of condense it, you know, what do do you see any major barriers or reasons why why we haven't kind of really fully you know flipped the switch so to speak in in adopting uh, that model? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think I, I sort of touched on it, um, Michael. You know, one is that uh, that there are going to be certain cases. Um, so if if you're um, let's t let's take our worst or our commonly the most the, the worst case in the United States is probably a relatively deep curve in either the Midcon or the uh, um, uh, or Permian Basin or the very ends of a lateral yeah uh, and and depending on how that well has been executed up to the point of the curve or the the end of, or the through the lateral and the amount of tortuosity that's been put in that and then the challenging rock types and the the prevailing dip angle of the formations um there are going to be situations where it just becomes extremely difficult and a Real craftsman or uh, a directional driller with a lot of experience is, uh, is 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 required, yeah. And and I think people cling to that too much, yeah. That they they cling to that you know two percent five percent situation where they really need an an expert out there, um, and so that puts them off going automated. Whereas if they if they if they take the overall performance across all their rigs and look at the remote directional drilling and the percentage of time when um, the technology won't be able to slide, I think that that uh, overcoming that and that's just humans managing the change process. The right. other one is I I believe that uh, the automation change from remote directional drilling with the driller filling the gap. We have to make that jump to the automation, and I believe currently commercial uh, there isn't an app that uh, is really good enough to do that. Right. Uh, and because an app isn't good enough to do that, that means that people then have to switch from mud motors to rotary steerable tools, and then rotary steerable tools come at a significant uh, higher price than uh, than mud motors, so they then mess with the economic. Yeah? Right, um, but there are always horizontal links that you know the economics are pretty well here. You know, once you get past two miles, three mile lateral, uh, you you the the frictional component of it and the time wasted sliding, be it automated or non automated, uh, you you may as well have a rotary steerable in the hole, and you can see that in the long laterals in in across U.S. land uh, that anything over a certain distance, the economics are. Uh, do your last run with a rotary steerable, or if the rotary steerable has the longevity, do the whole lateral with the uh, with the with the rotary steerable. Yeah. And I, I think we uh, we we might have a, a pending question from the audience uh, oh. in, in actually talking about 
rotary steerables as well. Um, but uh, to, to maybe give us some of the questions that we've had coming in, I uh, want to go ahead and bring Shelby Domain in and see if we can't get some of the, the questions that folks put in in the comment section and get those over to Tony. So, hey, Shelby. Hey, Michael. Um, absolutely, I love to get to some of these questions. So this first one comes from Facebook, actually, uh, from Tamir. And his question, here we go, uh, right there. So, uh, and the, there is a correction there. So what is the practical disadvantages of, he meant to say, RSS compared to positive displacement mud motors? Ah, okay. So, uh, yep, that was a, a, a topic that I taught for a lot a lot of years. And I also tried, uh, it, very interestingly, I sold both sides of the story. <laughs> so when I was in uh, uh, Slumberger, it was when uh, uh, Power Drive was uh, just coming to the market. So we, I spent two years selling Power Drive against motors. And then when I left uh, Slumberger and I was working for NOV, I uh, extolled the benefits of mud motors because NOV didn't have any rotary steerables. So if you take it from an engineering uh, point of view, though, um, rot rotary steerable, obviously, by continuously rotating the drill string from the surface, you're overcoming a large amount of the frictional component of the uh, of the well bore. So as long as that well bore is reasonably well executed, you will transfer the energy from the top drive to the drill bit in a in a relatively efficient way. Mm -hmm. So you're not limiting yourself by the frictional drag that you have when you're sliding with a mud motor. Um, one downside of rotary steerable is that you now no longer have the hydraulic uh, energy that you've created by the mud's fluid passing through the motor and turning the bit. So a mud motor but has, when it rotary drilling, it has the energy from the top drive and the additional energy so from coming from horsepower generated by the downhole motor. Um, to overcome that, a lot of the directional drilling com companies switch to downhole powered rotary steerable tools, so meaning putting a rotary steerable onto a mud motor and uh, drilling with uh, both uh, of that. Um, now, what you're ha getting then, though, is you're now starting to build a bottom hole assembly that is significantly more expensive than a drill bit and a bent motor. So a downhole powered rotary steerable, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, in U.S. land economics is probably in the ten to twenty thousand dollars a day. And a mud motor is in the uh, two to six thousand dollars a day. So depending on the economics and the cost of the rig uh, operation, the downhole powered rope restorable tool can really become uh, drive up the cost of the operation. But great question. And, and I would I would maybe add to that. Um, it, it really depends on the application. If you're offshore and your rig rate is two hundred thousand um, dollars, and and you're really uh, looking for um, you know uh, producing from an offshore reservoir at 20,000 barrels a day, uh, that's one thing. Uh, but if you're drilling in uh, in shale and less than a top tier asset, and you're really only expecting 400 barrels a day in peak oil, then it's probably not going to be worth it as much. Yeah. So very application dependent. Yeah, and, and rotary steerable really has become dominant offshore. Yeah, for that exact reasons and uh, uh, just the, the economics of a trip out of the hole for a failed motor or the uh, increase in tortuosity and, uh, and, and, and damaging the wellbore quality. Yeah, everyone went rotary steerable. I, I think, though, they went one step too far and there were sections still offshore that could be uh, competently executed with a mud motor at significantly less cost. But some of the skill sets to be able to run those motors, because we didn't have uh, remote or automated directional drilling, have yeah. gone away. So it's a bit of a catch-22. So the offshore drilling engineers just pick a rotary steerable tool, tool because they don't want to have to deal with the risk of having an inexperienced, non-motor capable directional driller out on the rig. Yeah. Mm -hmm. cool. Absolutely. So uh, the next question also comes from Facebook, actually, which is great. I love seeing questions come in from there as well. Uh, so Absi was wondering, what is the difference between automated RSS and remote operation that uh, you, Tony, were talking about earlier? Okay, so um, so automated rotary steerable. Okay, so automated rotary steerable means that uh, 
you can send a, a so a rotary steerable controls its uh, direction um, by as the as the drill bit rotates. There's either a non-rotating sleeve that pushes in the opposite direction to the direction in which you want to go to control the direction you're going in, or a fully rotating tool and a pad opens again 180 degrees from the direction you want to go. So if that that assembly is drilling ahead in on on its own and you want to change the direction in which it goes, a rotary steerable you just do what's called a downlink. So um, in uh, you what that may be is a series of uh, increasing the mud flow from uh, 80 uh, say say 400 gallons to 450 gallons and back down again is sending like a binary message down the hole to that tool. And once it gets the whole of that message, it will then change the direction it's uh, going to. Yeah. So the 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 rotary steerable tool does it automatically. Uh, I believe there is now um, closed loop capability in the rotary steerable market where the actual direction is already preloaded into the tool, and the and the tool is uh, following uh, a prescribed course. It still needs to know what the depth is, though. So there is still going to have to be some capability of downlinking to it. Remote directional drilling with a mud motor is you're controlling the direction of the orientation of the bend. So a mud motor has a uh, uh, has a has a kink in it. So if you imagine you've got these two, you've got a bent housing, and depending on how you would point that bent housing would control the direction in which you go. And that that bend is controlled by the orientation of the top drive. So you line up that bend with an MWD tool that sends pulses up that says that my bit is pointing uh, 30 degrees to the left. The top drive then has its own 360 degree orientation. So then it knows what how it's oriented. So if you want to turn it 30 degrees to further to the left, you send a command to the top drive that it will rotate 30 degrees and it will turn the downhole tool face from 30 left back to zero. So uh, that, that's how steering with a, a mud motor, which is much more technically complex than sending a downlink to a rotary steerable tool. Yeah. I, I admire how, how resourceful you are, uh, Tony, with uh, pens always ready to <laughs> Excellent. All right. So this next question, this will be the last one we'll get from the audience and then uh, we'll go back to, to some questions from you, Assad. So here it's, it's also FC from Facebook and uh, he asked, can RSS achieve the uh, DLS as PDM, which for those out there um, who aren't as abbreviation fluent as maybe the industry. So uh, we got acronym soup there. So can the rotary steerable system achieve the dog leg severity as the positive displacement motor? Okay. The answer is no. Yeah. So uh, uh, rotary steerable tools, I think the absolute uh, super top high end, very flexible limber uh, tools from uh, uh, Schlumberger and Baker and Halberton can achieve ooh, uh, 12 to 15 degrees per hundred. Yeah? Um, when I was drilling in Venezuela for um, uh, Oxy, we did what was called short radius, um, and that was to turn a well from vertical to horizontal inside the re reservoir, yeah? So we had a very narrow window to turn it. So we actually achieved 70 degrees per hundred uh, curve. So that means we went in a space of 120 feet from vertical to horizontal, yeah? Um, so there are wells, if you require greater than 15, maybe arguably 20 degrees per hundred, you have to do that with a uh, um, a PDM uh, to be able to get those angles. And if you want really extreme angles, you need articulated motors, and if you uh, and or a double bend. Yeah. So you have a bend at the bottom, and then you put a bent sub on the top of it, and you have to shim it up with uh, uh, little shims when you make up the connection, so that the two bends uh, align themselves so they're exactly in alignment, and then you have a double bend. And that is going to generate your short radius well. So a, a very small motor, two and three quarters, uh, with a double bend is going to achieve something in the range of 70 degrees per hundred. Yeah. So, uh, and actually talking automated directional drilling, the, the the there are probably only about five people in the world left that know how to do that. 
and I've forgotten as well, so I'm not counted in the five yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, that's pretty that's pretty pretty tough stuff, but still done for side tracks uh, occasionally. Yeah, I, I remember we uh, we drilled some wells in, in Saudi Arabia for Aramco uh, on their LSTK or Turnkey projects with uh, north of 60 degrees per hundred. Um, and we uh, weight transfer was always an issue. So we'd use the drilling agitator to, to help the motor get that um, into the horizontal. Absolutely. Yeah. Got to yeah. overcome that fric those friction. You know, the, the bigger the bend there, the greater the side forces. The more limber the assembly, the, the more um, uh, side loading you're getting, and, and it just becomes a, a cumulative problem that gets tougher and tougher. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I know we have a, a time crunch, but uh, I have uh, just uh, maybe last one uh, uh, for Tony. Uh, we've talked a little bit about uh, remote directional drilling. We know th the directional drilling space kind of leader in driving change because of how expensive and uh, critical it is. What do you think is next uh, for other conversations when it comes to uh, remote uh, operation on, on the rig? I think, uh, I think the mud man's the next one to drop. Yeah. Mm. So, uh, and, and that business model is, is somewhat broken anyway um, because the mud man, uh, he, he, he makes more money by, selling uh, more chemicals to solve problems that uh, that are occurring in, in the well. So if you uh, disconnect um, the chemistry and the uh, mud uh, uh, fluids from the measurement of the mud properties, yeah. uh, then the mud engineering role could be done uh, with a, um, a decent set of uh, sensors uh, on land, a, a potentially a small skid uh, offshore. Uh, the 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 complete fluid automation is uh, is already capable. Um, actually, NOV do produce that. Our group in Asker in uh, in Norway do complete fluid automation. So then you you start to adapt the role of the derrickman. So you have an uh, automated uh, derrickman and automated mudman, and then really the uh, mud company just have to deliver the chemicals to that the data is telling them that they have to uh, do. And actually, mud engineering is typically uh, a good mud engineer does a check every six hours, uh, and then maybe the PV, YP, um, and uh, weight are checked, you know, every hour or every 50, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, yeah. yeah. Um, whereas if you have continuous monitoring of it, maybe you can start to see trends so that you can really, really uh, stop the well deteriorating and save yourself a lot on chemicals because you're catching things very early. Um, so I, I think uh, I think that would be the next one to go. The problem is uh, the, the, the business model for that is, is, is tougher because you really have to sell well bore quality, uh, yeah. not just the removing the mud man from the, from the rig. Yeah? Um, and, you know, when you ask every drilling engineer, you know, how's your, mud, how's your well bore quality? Oh, my well bore is fine. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it's like, so I, I think that one. Someone like NOV or was one of we just have to get out and do that. Build a skid, measure the mud, and do uh, that automated uh, measurement of the mud properties, and uh, and analyze it and see whether we can make a make a business out of it. But uh, I think that's the that's that's the next one. Um, then probably mud loggers. Uh, you can do the, you can do their job pretty well with uh, uh, all the sensors on the rig site and a bit of videometry. So that you can tell, you can you can tell now coming over the shakers the difference between a limestone, a sandstone, a shale. So you can at least do percentage of rock type coming over the. Sh and so do you really need much more than that if you integrate it with LWD? Probably not. So I I think uh, you know the question that Equinor asked us two years ago in NOV was, uh, can you build us a semi sub for the Arctic with only 50 people on it? You know. Uh, and and I, I, I think that's absolutely doable. You, you've got to think a bit out of the box. Um, yeah. You've got to have good data away from uh, the rig. Uh, but, uh, you know, when Equinor say that each man, for, the cost per year per person is 1.25 million out on a rig in the Arctic. One, but each person is going to cost them one and a quarter million to be out there with helicopter flights, the size of the rig that has to be built, the uh, wages, salary, whatever it is, yeah. Yep. It's a, if you can reduce it from 100 people to 50 people, that's a lot of savings, yeah. So. 
Wow, man. I, uh, if we had more time, Tony, I, I'd give you the, the red carpet, but uh, we've uh, we've kind of run out, but this has been really, really interesting and, and so obviously exciting. the expertise uh, between you and, and certainly Assad as well uh, certainly shines through. So look forward to, to actually tackling this topic again and uh, maybe diving in uh, a, a little bit deeper, but I appreciate you joining us, Tony. It's been, been really good. Uh, do, we, do we have one, do we have one minute? Cause I did see one really cool question here. Uh, ah. Yeah. Um, someone's asking, you know, can we downhole adjust the mud mirror? Yeah. Ah, okay. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, you know, that really is, uh, that's that uh, tool. Uh, and, and that's a that's, we have that in the NOV. It's called Select Shift, and we can change the downhole uh, bend setting, which was you know I, I have to say when I was a directional driller I would have absolutely loved to have that piece of kit and go from something like a seven degree bend to a one point eight or whatever and have that flexibility to make it you know nice draw a straight line or drill a curve um, with a simple pick up off bottom turn it and put it back on bottom yeah. So that is uh, that's blowing and uh, and going, and I think that will challenge some of the rotary steerable market out there, uh, because that that is a in 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 essence a a very ultra simple rotary steerable tool. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Well, uh, actually, that now that you uh, talk about that, yeah, we actually uh, have a site that has that. So select shift. Uh, what, what Tony just mentioned, if, if you, you or anyone else want to check it out, uh, we can certainly uh, have the information there and can get in touch with you uh, there if you have any questions. So good, good eyes, Tony. Appreciate that. Uh, cool. Todd, thanks as always for your analysis and, and insight. Thank and you. for all of those watching, thank you for joining us this week on the Ask Assad Show. Uh, as always, look forward to continuing the conversation next week. So for all of us here at NOV, thanks for watching and for listening, and we'll talk to you later.